Yes, guys, welcome back to Chelsea Fan TV. Welcome back to another episode of Five Things We Learned. Show where we go through all the major talking points of an away win. An away win. I didn't expect to be talking about this. I expected to be talking about us getting knocked out of another cup competition. But here we are. Here we are. We produce a very, very good performance away at Aston Villa. Before we start the video, as always, I do want to say that this video is sponsored by Match Bingo. This week's big games are brought to you by Match Bingo, where every goal, save, throw in, corner, or substitution can win you cash prizes. Try it out with 10 free cards a month. 99% of Premier League and Championship games are on the app at £2 a card. Every card purchase supports the Stroke Association and players must be 18 and over. Terms and conditions apply. Please play responsibly. But yeah, that's just a little word from our sponsors. Let's get back into the game. And yeah, we beat Aston Villa 3-1 in what was a very, very comprehensive performance. We needed that. Poch needed that. The players needed that. The team needed that. The fans needed that. I'm so happy for every away fan that travelled for that because I know it was a very, very good night for them. And they sounded amazing. First minute to last, the away fans were unbelievable. Um, I like the way we set up. I like the way we were set up defensively on the ball and off the ball. The little 4-4-2 that we were set up in was really good. It was really compact and it didn't give us it didn't give the opposition a lot of holes to try and penetrate the side with. Pause. But yeah, it was nice to see us bury our chance as well. Conor Gallagher gets his first goal. I know I didn't bring that up in the fan cam. I know people can say, oh, Gallagher agenda and everything. I promise you on my life, I just forgot who scored the first goal. Both videos, I was thinking, right, oh, the second and the third. Who's Who scored the first? Who scored the first? Let me not pretend so I don't sound silly on camera. But yeah, um, nice cutback from Jackson. Madueke and Gallagher with a great finish. Finally gets his first goal of the season for Chelsea. Who knows? Might get a couple more. We'll have to wait and see. But yeah, good goal from him. Um, good link up between Enzo, I think it was De Sassi, Gusto and Jackson for the second goal. And from that point on, Chelsea are comfortable. You can see the panic on Aston Villa. They look a lot more erratic in possession. We look a lot more structured. We look a lot calmer. We're not looking as wasteful on the ball. The first point I wanted to bring in is we finally have Enzo and Caicedo played closer to each other. We, we saw Caicedo drop back a bit more towards the centre-backs. We saw um, Enzo dropping a bit deeper close to him as well. And it helped us so much so much more of our progressive passing. Enzo with the little switches, the little one-two touch play. It was so, so beneficial to us in terms of bringing the ball from defence to attack. And it's all that we've asked for. All I've asked for is stop putting Enzo further forward than my number nine. Stop putting Enzo around the left wing. Let's bring him a bit closer to the guy that we paid £115 million to play next to. And look at the result. Look at the result. It was very refreshing, very good to see. Now I just need to see it again. Because we've been here before where we've had good performances and we've just gone up and back down. Now I need us to try and build an upward trajectory. But yeah, it was good to see Enzo and Caicedo link up really well. And I just want to see that a little bit more. Another two players in the attack, Jackson and Madueke, both on the wings. They offered us a lot more um, structure defensively. I think they were both very smart in possession. Our possession, Jackson still had a couple of bad moments. But in possession, looked better. And we said him playing on the wing kind of um, does well in terms of getting more of his fundamentals out of the game. The ball carrying, the dribbling, the interplay. Stuff that we already know he's good at. When he's up front, he needs to focus more on his finishing. And his finishing is inconsistent. But all the other attributes of his game are there. And you get to utilise them a lot better with him playing on the wing. Whether we, whether him playing at wing is better than him playing up top, we need a bit of a bigger surface area to get to that point. But it was a good game. It was a good game. Just build on it. Just build on it. It's good to see Jackson starting games for us again. We missed him so much. So much during the, the African Cup of Nations. And I know it's a shame he didn't make it through and everything, but the greedy side of me is just glad. Because we needed him back. Big up to Broyer and everything. But Broyer just was not it. He was not it. Um, what else? There's, there's been a big question. Are we better without Thiago Silva and Sterling? Now, with Thiago Silva, again, the surface area isn't too big to get to a conclusion with. The only games that he hasn't really played are against the weaker teams. 
because I've seen I have seen stats saying oh we we are a lot better statistically without silver. There's a reason why stats can be manipulated to just give you a certain point. Silver's not played enough games against I mean he's not missed enough games against difficult opposition for us to even say that. But if you watch the way we play, we can push a little bit higher without silver. We're a lot quicker playing out from the back without silver. There's a lot more cover for the fullbacks when they push forward without Thiago Silva. So there might be a bit of an uncomfortable conversation to be had. I don't know if people are ready for that sort of conversation. But I've been saying all season, Thiago Silva has been declining. This is not the Thiago Silva from last season. Where he's still like making blocks and having good defensive actions. He's also getting caught out a lot more. He's also a lot easier to deal with if they push him out wide. Also, playing in the back four for him was already going to be a problem. We can't really push up as high without Thiago Silva. And also, when we have the poor midfield structure that we've spoken about over the last six months or so, it exposes Thiago Silva. Or, if anything, you can make a counter-argument that you need someone more athletic than Thiago Silva in order to be able to make, make way for a structure like that. So, we might have to have that conversation because I've been saying, like, we're not going for league titles and everything, so... Realistically, I would rather prioritise a younger centre-back partnership. Let them get used to each other. Let them make mistakes together. Let them build an understanding. Other than doing that next season when we're meant to be trusting the process. How about we trust the process with our back line? We have to see. We have to see. Now, I would like to see the Sassy and Badia Shield start the next league game. See how it works from there. If we can keep a clean sheet. If we look just as good as we did in the last game. Maybe go to City with that, with that back 2-2. Two -two. That would be the real test. But yeah, we have to see. We have to see. Good performance from the Sassy and Badia Shield, though. In terms of Sterling, I think we're a lot better defensively from the wings without Sterling. I think Madueke and Jackson give you better ball retention. Although I feel like that's as far as I can go in terms of without Raheem Sterling. Because if he's still one of the most likely attackers to get you GNA. He's still one of our more creative forwards. So, like, you can only criticise him to a certain point, but he has been a little bit inconsistent. I do think he has a habit of just constantly trying to dribble his way out of situations, even when the opportunity isn't there. So you do have to see. You do have to see. It all depends. But, yeah, I would like to see us try without without Silva. Hell, I wouldn't mind seeing the exact same lineup go into the Crystal Palace game. And then just build our judgments based off that. But I see the conversation going around. And it's a conversation that I don't think is unfair to have. Um, what else? Has Pochettino turned the corner? That's another point. No. It's as simple as that. Very very good first half. Second half again wasn't great. I was going to back five. Only gave Villa more confidence. You could see that in the way the last 15 minutes went. I don't think he's done nearly enough to even turn a corner. It's just we needed that victory. We needed that victory. You needed that victory. It was good to see the first half structure. I still don't think he coached a good 90 minutes. I think he coached a good first half. And like the free kick from Enzo was just... <coughs> we're done. We're done. Game is finished. But yeah. Build on it. Build on it. We move on to the final point. Crystal Palace away. No Eze. No Elise. No Mark Gay. Come on now. We have to win this. We got to win this. If we can't beat Palace away, these lot want their manager gone as well. If we can't beat Palace away, oh, we are finished. We are finished. Just start as you mean to go on. Everything after Palace away looks bleak. So go and get the three points in this game as a bare minimum. And let's just try and take everything else a game at a time. But yeah, big up to everybody that's locked in. It's been another episode of 5 Things We Learned. Let me know all your thoughts down in the comment section below. Potch out and up the Chelsea.